All right, Chris, we are on. We are live, LinkedIn live, streaming again for the third time live. Um, really appreciate those who are joining us. Remember, please feel free to chat in thoughts, comments, questions that you have. We're going to pop those questions up on the screen so you can actually see that we are interacting with you. And um, we love that type of interaction, Chris and I both. So we hope you do that. And if you want to know where you're at, you'll, we're talking about your brain and complex environments, your brain and complex environments. And for me, Chris, I usually spell brain wrong. So I have to double check multiple times that I'm not, that I'm not spelling Brian. Yes, it's not Brian science. It's not Brian science. So without further ado, Mr. Casey, let's hit this thing. What do you got for me? Well, you, you know, David, I think it's probably good to start with a little bit of a foundation in terms of why the uh, more biologic or neuroscientific approach to um, management per, and analysis, if you're in the, the BA world, um, how that uh, plays into your day-to-day -day job and, uh, and actually minute-to-minute -minute activities. So tell us a little bit about the, uh, um, you know, the, the background behind this and why it's so important. Yeah, we're not going to go into deep science. We're going to keep it very pragmatic. So what we want to realize first and foremost is that our brain has evolved with an element of pessimism associated with it. Um, that pessimism was a survival technique to control our actions and activities so we, that we thought more deeply about what we were doing before we did it, or at least we protected ourselves, or we would protect ourselves. So first off, there's this element of pessimism. With that, there's also an element of wanting to survive. Your brain wants to survive. And it also wants to do it as, as efficiently as possible. So pessimism, survival, efficiency. And you can get a really good look at this from Daniel Kuhneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. But let's let's look at this one step further. Let's start talking about efficiency. Our brains are 2% of our bodies, but they take up 20% of the energy we put into our body. It does not like to get into cognition unless it really has to. Right. It stays in what the uh, what the neuroscientists would call the mind wandering mode rather yes. than the executive mode. Those yes. are the, the neuroscientific terms for those. Right. And I and I give you a great example to this. If I do two presentations like this during the day, I am white zapped and I have another one tonight. And then by the end of the night tonight, because of these two things, man, I'm going to be exhausted. So. We have to understand that under most conditions, our brain just wants to keep things consistent. It wants to work within the consistent world we're at because it doesn't want to jump to that higher level thinking. So that's the first time, first thing about it. Now, the second thing is survival and survival and pessimism go hand in hand. It wants to live. And we're going to talk a little bit about change and our how we have a struggle with change. The, your brain doesn't like change because it doesn't understand the new stream it's going to go into or the well, new I, environment. I, I, I might challenge you a little bit on that. Okay. In that, uh, that our brains are actually wired for novelty. So while I don't disagree with your pessimism uh, uh, assertion, um, the brain responds very well to, to change, except change on its own term. So we talk about change in a larger sense, the behavioral side of things. But from a neuroscientific standpoint, uh, the brain loves change, and it loves change into that mind-wandering mode. And you get a shot of dopamine when that happens, and it makes you feel good, which is kind of why, from the um, a social media standpoint, how kind of insidious it is. But... You, but that might your... be in a situation, though, and like, like we could debate this as it relates to the cognitive dissidence of lost regret and the cognitive dissidence of, of time discounting. You know, we, va we value today more than we value tomorrow because it's what is tangible. It's what is understandable that, br that br our brain likes that. You know, it may it may want to wander, but you have also instincts to say, 
you know, this is easier, this is safer. That survival mechanism comes into play. And then with lost regret, we know that a number of people don't even want to make steps for something new because they fear that they may fail in that. And because they're going to fail in that, they don't want to take that step. And that's really part of neuroscience related to the distortions you have at the cognitive level. So there's a couple elements there that we, you know, we can think back and forth on. Um, the real challenge, though, is we have to understand this is going on without us thinking about it. You know, right. we, we sit in here and we, we we're frustrated about why we haven't been able to change or adjust or, you know, why we're exhausted when we think too much or why do we constantly just solve the same problem with the same heuristic patterns over and over again. There are rationales associated with that, that you can overcome, but you're not naturally hardwired to do that instinctively. Just like when we talk about being self-organized, we're not hardwired to to instinctually work in a team without a leader. Human beings are hardwired to ultimately pick someone who's going to lead for them and then drive through with that leader. So, you know, that's another element that you have to cross that bridge to get to. But what we want to assert here is that your brain is tricking you and your brain can put you down paths that you don't want to be down if you don't think and stop and, and process what's going on. Right. There's a layer of, of cognition and, and forceful perception, I think would be a, uh, or focused perception that essentially overrides the evolutionary aspects of why your brain would react that way. And you can mm-hmm. feel that, uh, as I'm sure many of the, uh, folks in the audience in that when you get into a situation and, uh, there's something not quite right about it. You feel something in your gut. You feel s- your palms start sweating. Your respiration changes. And all of that's happening without you actually, you're conscious of it, but you're not consciously forcing those behaviors. It's a conscious effort to stop those autonomic uh, r- reflexes, to allow you to take a step back to take a breath, to focus, to uh, remain um, or get out of the mode where your lower level base neuroscience uh, instincts are kicking in. And I think that's what you're uh, that's what you're referring to. But let me make one other point, because you mentioned earlier that you do a couple of these presentations and by the end of the day, you're wiped. Mm -hmm. Well, that has a very, very uh, easy to understand biologic component to it, which is every time your mind switches from one task to another or has to stay concentrated in a, in a focusing sense, it's, as you mentioned earlier, it's it's taking up energy resources from your, your brain. And we all have, you know, we all sit on a different spectrum in terms of how much capacity we have. Mm-hmm. But when you use that up, that, that, the the stuff that allows you to make those switches then things like making a simple decision any decision like what do you want for dinner um becomes an impossible thing for you to accomplish because you got nothing to fuel making mm-hmm. that decision and that's those resources the, are gone that's right the body hacks are so incredibly important in knowledge work and it, exactly. you know and I guess the, the summary of this is our brains are not built for knowledge work. They haven't evolved yet to really get into the context of knowledge work. So, you know, John asked the questions about other source materials associated with this. I've been reading a book called Chatter, which gets into the, 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 the brain self-talk issues surrounding this. Um, you can read a lot on Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell ties into the behavioral economic elements. He himself was a psychi- psychologist. Um, Chris and I are both adaptive leader, leader people. And Roy Heifetz, wrote a, he's a psych- he was a psychiatrist. Then he moved into the idea of um, adaptive leadership, taking into consideration a lot of these mental games and physiological ch- games that happen with us. So, Chris, is there any other source material you'd want to throw out there besides you know, practical adaptive leadership, the book Chatter, you know, David and Goliath um, is one of the tipping points, another one. I found my my go-to source, at least for the neuroscience, and it gets a little a little uh, uh, dense at the at the beginning, uh, or I'll 
towards the end, I should say, is Daniel Levitin's The Organized Mind. Uh, it came out in 2014. Great, and, great um, and that gives a, a, a really nice overview of the evolutionary aspects of the, the neuroscience, but then gets into some pragmatic details in terms of how it affects our daily lives. Excellent. So let's keep going. So we have, you know, we have this picture now. We understand that here's our brain. It doesn't match up with knowledge work. Some ideas about why. Are you feeding it right? So if you're going to heavy cognition, you're going to run out of energy. You got this pessimism slant. Yes, although your brain wants to be curious, it does. But there's other things at play stopping us sometimes from making that step to that curiosity. Um, let's jump into it in more detail. Yeah, let's dive down a little bit more about the, uh, you know, your the emotional uh, distortions or the cognitive disturbances that that happen yeah, the in good our, stuff, man. our everyday lives. The emotional side is really, really, really insidious from my perspective because um, I think people forget that they don't hear with their ears and they don't see with their eyes. Our brains process the stuff that's coming into us. And that, and because of the way our brains are set up, that initial response, like Chris was talking about, is very much tied to run, fight, run, fight, freeze, or fawn. Now the psychologists are bringing fawn into play as well. And this this idea. She's a that, lovely woman, by the that, way. There you go. It's right. So you know, if we're in a in a in a complex environment, we're we're thinking with a in system one that we're just there doing the things we're used to we get hit with a scathing email we know what happens fear want to run away nervous mountain out of a molehill because or our, fight or, or fight. fight yeah start yell scream so our initial reaction as we're processing information is about survival and it's about survival really from a physical standpoint because we are still attuned to protecting ourselves physically more so than mentally now you, we get, we could get to that mental side very quickly but you have to control and understand that emotional response very basic concept is count to 10 count to 10 before some reaction to give yourself as chris you were talking about back up and think about it but this also ties into then the element of negative self-talk which is a part of that emotional response that can really affect your ability to act. And this ties back to cognitive behavioral health therapy, which we we'll, can throw back some questions on me as it, on this, but all right, I'm working. I know I'm going to deal with the emotional response because that's the first thing I have to work through. I got to protect myself from retreating, not reacting, reacting too strongly, you know, or, you know, basically freezing up and not being able to get anything done for that day. I know I've had strong emotional reactions to things that came to me and I just basically became completely unproductive for that day. So that was my freeze mechanism. Right. Thoughts? No. And that's a great uh, that's a great point. The um, the ability uh, and we're we're now right over the last 10 to 15 years, we have been conditioned and humans like most animals are very susceptible con to conditioning. Yeah, just and one we, thinking, man. Just we're just going to go in the zone. Exactly, and we get conditioned on a, a on a minute by minute basis through social media, through broadcasts, through just bombardment of mess messages that come, you know, into our uh, sphere of of perception. And and one other thing about that is is that uh, we're not all that fast at. <laughs> taking that information in I mean, our bandwidth is only about 120 bits per second yeah which which means that if you're listening to somebody like i'm listening to you now and somebody comes in over here and interrupts me or i hear something off in the distance then my bandwidth gets collapsed because it's not that big to begin with yeah so so those those things come into play as well. But uh, please go on with the uh, with the cognitive uh, distortion side of things. Well, before we do that, the last piece I want oh, to think. Sorry. A little, I don't know. I want to dig a little bit into the, the the self talk. And when I do presentations on this, as it relates to the pragmatism side of you know how your brain operates, I ask people if they know what self talk is. And disturbingly to me, I mean, maybe twenty percent will raise their hands and say they know what it is. And it is the it's it's the thing 
that can cause you to not be able to perform optimally and stop you from doing things that you would ultimately enjoy. Your, your self-talk is what you're saying behind the scenes, within your head, about all types of things. And the best example I do for this is presentations. You know, more people fear doing a presentation in front of a group than they fear death. It's crazy. And what happens with a presentation is your negative self-talk goes into freaking crazy mode. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. They're going to make fun of me. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to look goofy. And nobody wants to look goofy. Nobody wants to look strange. You know, and you get this. And the, the real big problem with the emotional distortions is that they really start to express themselves physically. That negative self-talk then expresses itself, as you said, Chris, headaches, heart palpitations, horrible stomach problems, IBS. Um, you also have diverticulitis issues. These are all issues. The, electron the electrical centers of our bodies, our brain, our heart, our intestines are significantly impacted by this emotional distortions that occur to the point where you're going. That's where we talk about stress killing you. Stress killing you is the part of you not able to get control of the emotional reaction that our brains have, and it's usually centered around fear. Although you have fight, we have anger issues as well, um, but that fear and you absorb it, and then your body starts to puke it back up because you're not able to control it, and that all centers around that negative self-talk. And that's where the book Chatter is just an amazing book tied to really getting a centering perspective of that negative self-talk. Now, does that help with uh, imposter syndrome? Absolutely. That's the basis of imposter syndrome, brother, right? right? I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I can't handle this. I'm going to get caught here. People are going to see through me. People are going to think I don't know what's going on. Um, I never can do this. I never can do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. And it's insidious and it's happening. And, it's ha and it starts to just run on a continuous cycle if you don't take it in check. And that's why people, you know, like to talk about meditation as it relates to fighting negative self-talk because meditation at least starts to teach you to see. You can see these thoughts. You just don't absorb the thoughts. There's no way you're going to stop all that negative self-talk and all that self-talk. A lot of self-talk is positive. A lot of self-talk can be very very valuable. But what you can do is you can see it and understand it and be able to push away the negative and focus and absorb the positive ones. Right. Strengthening Re you. Retraining to uh, to uh, suppress the uh, the negative side and or even just push it away. Side. It is what it is. Right. It is what it, there right. that goes, whoo, it flies away. And that's when I've done a lot of stuff on meditation. I love the one person's example from um, oh god, what's the what's it called? I forgot the name of the app, but basically push it away, push it away, and then and then you can start getting comfortable. But long story short, is the emotional side is the where stress comes from. It's where we have a lot of challenges with enjoyment at work. And it's where a lot of folks need to, we need to start teaching on this as it relates to knowledge workers being more productive. So how, um, you know, in the modern work environment, and, and I'm sure the folks who are uh, listening today, um, if they're not being affected by this, um, let's find out where they work, because that would be a good, good thing to know. But we're all uh, overloaded. We've got more oh, yeah. more stuff that we need to do, not just in terms of our, um, our our work life, but our personal lives as well. And you know, our brains can't discriminate necessarily between work and play or home. It's uh, hard. And, and those those look at the those... TV show Severance. Severance has a, that talks about that, by the way, on we... Apple TV. The fact that the, in that world you segment, you have the work life and you have the home life, and neither one of them bleed in. And you don't even know who you are in each one. Right. Interesting concept, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, I think the thing there you got to think through is the fact that everything's not important. Everything's not important. And you have the power 
to be able to start deciphering what is important and what isn't important. And that's the whole adaptive leadership thing around dispensable versus indispensable. But if we think everything's important, of course, we're, we're, our, we're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. I'm never going to get this all done. I'm never going to get this all done. I'm going to fail at home. I'm going to upset my spouse. I'm going to upset my partner. That's, that's the real killer. And the killer is, is that underneath having all that stuff is the negative self-talk telling you you're going to fail, where if you start teaching to process it and prioritize it and put it to the, in its place, and, you know, it is what it is. Right. It is what it is. There are some things that are what they are. But um, great point on that, Chris. Great, great, great point on that. And by the way, folks, questions. We got a lot of group people out there, actually. Love to get some questions or comments or thoughts from the group. So don't hesitate to shoot it at us. So keep going, Mr. Chris. What do we got? We got a well, little I, I, there. I want to have some fun. I want to drill down a, just a little bit on this this last topic, which is the um, the concept of multitasking. Oh, that's um, your baby. So you go, you do the multitasking things. I still want to do a couple of cognitive distortions. All right. So do multitasking. I'm going to, I'm going to take you through a real quick uh, uh, multitasking, which is, as we've been talking about here from the neuroscience side of things, we talk about uh, using up those resources that we have so that at the end of the day, or at some point, it could come earlier than the end of the day, you just run out of juice. Mm -hmm. And it's that juice that, multitasking um, neuroscience has has uh, has told us that every time you switch you're using up that juice and multitasking is nothing but switching so if you are in your job and you are reactive meaning a an email comes across your desk a chat message comes through a text message comes in on your phone and your first impulse is to grab it and see what it is. So, and this is what what really gets insidious about the uh, about the multitasking piece is is that once you do that, you get a little hit of dopamine because it's a, it's novel, right? It's yep. new. But then, immediately after that, you get a hit of cortisone or one of yeah, the fear. Or, or, or caffeine, right? That's and the emotion, exactly, or and adrenaline. So it, mm -hmm. it 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 rips you out of that mode, the novelty mode, and puts you in this other one. And as that continues, the more time you do that, if you're doing it multiple times an hour, your your st stress level and your now some of us right who say, oh, I'm a great multitasker. Well, the the fact of the matter is is that you may have more capacity for that tax task switching. But nobody is a multitasker. Or maybe they fe feed off the adrenaline, adrenaline more than you should. Which well, is affecting I, their cognition. Yes. So you might multitask, but you're probably making crappy decisions. Exactly, exactly. So I want to just make sure that the audience realizes that one of the things that helps drive and uh, and is, is diff very, very difficult to overcome in concert with this, the uh, doing away with the negative self-talk is essentially focusing your world so that you aren't being whipsawed back and forth continually. You control it. You take some and control. you control it. That's that's exactly right. I love how you talk through that because yes, we're conditioned to jump all over the place. Now we have to fight through that, build the habits. So there's the the Tiny Habits book is a great book to start putting some of these things into action. What I want to dig into now is this, so we're at the we're going to the cognition level. We we. We've learned to deal with some of the emotional stuff. We've controlled some of our multitasking scenarios. Now we're thinking, now we have other problems. The, the, most of the folks here are influencers. Most likely have using the referent or referent power base, not the positional power base, but some probably are. So you want to influence appropriately, but you start having emotional reactions to some of these confirmation biases so if you can put the confirmation bias in the right box you can start learning techniques to get around those to create the emotions that can drive people to keep moving forward and the one i talk about a lot is lost regret lost regret is a, a really big problem in project environments because it stops people from really trying to embrace that change i mean we are 
you're right. We like novelty. We like to jump around the different things. But ultimately, the brain wants to be in the setting it's at, what it's comfortable with. A new, any new big setting is going to is going to ultimately make you fearful, unless you are completely understanding that it's going to be hugely positive. So when you're dealing with change and you're seeing people scared, frustrated, anxious, the issue is they're not jerks. The issue is there's a confirmation bias there stopping them from taking that next step. So being able to tell stories, to wrap around, getting them more bought into the change is going to be okay for them is a way to help them break through the confirmation bias and start moving more forward. Or, or taking, in addition to the story, taking a more active role in trying to discover and bubble up one of those, what, whatever those things are that are getting in the way. And, and yes. the, the earlier you can do that in the process, um, like before you present your change, the better off the change will be accepted. And I think we got the question from John about TikTok and phones and such. It goes back to Chris's whole conversation about multitasking. Basically, that's multitasking. You're jumping between different devices. You, you might be watching multiple videos. Even when you're just on the phone, you're watching multiple videos, different multiple videos. You're going through all of what Chris talked about. And then you're training your brain to operate that way. And then you're going to be operating in really what I would say is horrible cognition mode. The inability to operate and the inability to really think deeply. And the critical skills that we need for success and complexity is critical thinking, problem solving, systems thinking. And that whole multitasking story Chris talked about is what inhibits deep critical thinking. And we are continually training ourselves and those in other generations to operate in the multitasking mode than operate in the stop, think, process, work, stop, think, process, work, and get deeper into the things they're doing. And right. Laura, talk, and look at this. Laura talks about time blocks. I'm a big, big proponent of time blocks um, where, all right, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to have a three-hour time block and I'm going to focus on this. And then I'm going to take a rest, or I might take a rest every 20 minutes or so in that time block. Go yeah, ahead. so there's a method that was developed in the 80s called the Pomodoro method. The Pomodoro method, absolutely. And, and uh, the Pomodoro is Italian for tomato, and that happened yep. to be the uh, the shape of the timer that this particular psychologist used. And he breaks down cycles into 25-minute uh, work, work periods with a three- to five-minute break. But I want to go back just for a second to, to uh, John, uh, John's question about what the TikTok and everything are doing to our brains. There was an article published in the New York Times uh, just the end of last month, uh, January 22nd, by David Marchese. And the title of it is, The Digital Workplace is Designed to Bring You Down. <laughs> and um, if you read through that article, it will... Um, it will answer a lot of your questions with regard to uh, what um, what the current digital trans transition, the transformation that's there, you know, how it is um, um, affecting uh, our behavior, not only of adults, but of, of, of children as well. And Joseph here says, I've seen it in the IT training, but it's really hard to stop multitasking. What are some of the techniques you use to stop jumping back and forth? And, First off, I, I am a Joe, I'm a huge fan of time blocks and I'm a huge fan of the Pompadour method because those are two great tools to use. Okay, 25 minutes of focused activity here. Break. Look and see if there's anything important. What's my next task? 25 minutes. Or am I going back to the same task to finish it? But you're doing 25 increments. It's almost like agile. It's like you are taking a go ahead, Chris, what are you gonna say? Yes. Like agile. No. No, no, no. You're you're absolutely right. But what what's important to understand is just blocking the time is not the total solution. Keep going. Yeah, it, add to it. Or, 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 right. Well, you have to you have to be able to prioritize what you're doing. Yeah. You don't want to you don't want to spend 25 minutes doing something stuff. that's not important. Right. E exactly. So you have to. But that takes critical thinking, Chris. Right. So exactly. Well, it's taking a step back and saying, okay, I have this amount of time. Where do I want to spend it? What's the highest and best use of how I can do that? And that might be 
something that needs to be done for your family. It may be something that needs to be done for your employer. It may need be something that needs to be done for a friend uh, or a coworker. You're going to see, so, you're stepping back, you're seeing all these things. First, you're stepping back, you're checking your, am I processing any negativity emotionally? All right, can I get control over that? Then I, if I've got that control, I'm looking at my picture. What are my priorities? I got a lot of things swirling. All right, I'm going to pick these two priorities. I'm going to pull them down and I'm going to work on those. All right, maybe it's just, I'll take one first and the other second. Use the Pompadour method, process it through it. When you're finished with the first 25 minutes, go back and look and say, okay, has anything happened that I need to reprioritize? If not, good, I'll finish this. Pompadour method, break. Go back. I'm done here. I'm going to, if, all right, look back up. All right, what's Ex happening? It, it, exactly. If you were to pick one of the seven habits of highly effective people by Covey, you know, in a very old book, but the first habit is do first things first. Yes. So uh, I understand, right? Exactly. I had an old manager, man. She was all, I had a manager back when I was 25 years old, Georgetown Sweep said, David, David, do the hard stuff first, David. I know you don't want to. Do the hard stuff. I mean, man, God, Joan Carroll, it was amazing. You know, and I'm like, to this day, I remember that. Even though I don't want to do that, I, that's the stuff I got. It always ends up being that way, right? The highest priority thing is the thing you don't want to touch. Right. Well, there is, you know, the, the quadrant with the urgent and important and the yeah. non-urgent and non-important and yep. uh, being able to... And this can be done fast. Internal. We're not saying you're, oh. you have to... Have, we, we are told to do this. You just step back, look, process. Okay, two, two. Think critically, think about it. All right. Maybe go back and look at your purpose. Okay, purpose was this. Critically think it. Sometimes at the old company I have, we call it the main thing. If you're working, take a step back. Does that tie back to the main thing? But the, it all goes back to the first step, right, Chris? Pulling back. It, 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 exactly. So we're we're at the bottom of the hour. Oh, we got. I still want to hit confirmation bias, but let's okay. hit confirmation bias and let these folks go. But please, any additional questions? Sergey had a great comment. Joe, thank you so much for that question you threw in there. If anyone has any additional questions, go pop them in there. But for knowledge workers, if you're doing all of this well, you have to watch out for confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is probably the biggest blocker to creativity. And it has elements of wanting to be like having like-minded people around you, which makes you comfortable. And it just has elements of, you know, we ultimately get fixated and we don't want to see other views because we might be really busy or, you know, we might have a strongly held belief. This is the righteous mind. But what people do suffer from confirmation bias, we have to check ourselves. And one of the best ways to check ourselves in confirmation bias is listening to dissenting ideas. Forcing yourself to hear somebody else give you critique or reading something different tied to that. And then allowing some conflict. Though conflict, seeking other perspectives, allowing for dissenting voices or some of the key elements of learning to break confirmation bias. But Chris, as you know, it's so hard. It's right. So hard. Well, um, you know the uh, the great uh, writer creator Neil Simon uh, said in writing comedy, "There is no comedy without conflict." Yeah. Um, and um, if you kind of keep that in the back of your mind as well as you look at these things, um, it <laughs> it kind of helps to put things in perspective. And that the conflicts that are there are really ones that are created, they could be created externally to you, in which case it's like, well, that's you. Right. Um, but they also can be created internally as well. And recognizing those things, as you put out, to, to get the, the, those cognitive distortions under control is a very powerful concept if you can master it. Man, well, it's been a pleasure, Chris. Thank you all. It looks like we don't have any additional questions at this point, but we do monitor questions afterwards. So if you want to pop something in, we'll go back and take a look for, I think we're done. We're done. Very we're good. Our broadcast. Thank you all. Have a great well, th one. Thanks, David. Bye. Thanks, everybody.